Well, first of all, thank you very much, Philip, for this very kind introduction, uh, for these very nice words. Um, and also thank you for giving me this opportunity to talk a little bit about uh, some of the research which has been going on at this university and also in other places. Now, what I'd like to talk about today and what is really hidden in the title is something we know about on a very fundamental level. Um, particles are interacting with each other. So we know they live in a quantum world, so we need to investigate these quantum effects very carefully. But the message, which I hope you will be taking home after uh, uh, maybe 45 minutes from now, is that these couplings of fundamental particles carry information which we can exploit to predict what is going to happen at shortest distances and at highest energies. So we might be in a position to actually predict what these fundamental degrees of freedom which govern everything we observe in this universe, yes, ought to be looking like. So, this was the short executive sum summary. Let me now try to explain those things in more detail. So, I want to talk about couplings, couplings which are on a run. So, what's a coupling in physics? See, I'm talking to you, okay? So, it means you're listening. By that token, we are already coupled. I'm coupled to you, you're coupled to me. Okay? Uh, the technicalities underneath that are a bit more intricate because I have to open my mouth, generate some sound waves, they have to propagate to your ear, they generate some vibration, which is generating an electrical current which reaches your brain. Okay, and suddenly it's doing something in your brain, okay? So maybe um, it triggers uh, the desire to fall asleep. <laughs> okay, or maybe it triggers the desire to actually ask a question, to which I totally would invite you to please do at any point during my presentation. Okay, but be, be it as it may, it simply means that we are coupled. Now, in physics, we really love to get to the bottom of things. So the way this coupling works on a more fundamental level, of course, yes, is that we would want to understand how couplings between the smallest of imaginable ingredients by which nature is built upon, how these couplings work. And the centerpiece for that, you will see, is are going to be quantum aspects of physics. Okay, um, so I'm going to explain that in some detail because it is important, but the key point is going to be that because we live in a quantum world, what we think is a coupling constant, okay, so which explains how things are coupled to each other, actually isn't a constant at all. It's going to depend on energy or distance. And it is precisely this dependence which contains a lot of information for us. Okay, so let's get started. Um, so in physics, when you want to get to the bottom of things, of course, you always imagine that these things are very, very, very small. So you aim for the smallest objects in nature. So now we, of course, we are humans, hopla. Okay, so our typical size is a meter or a few, two meters, okay? Um, but we are constructed certainly out of atoms. Now atoms are already quite a bit smaller. 10 to the minus 10 meter is their length. Now, to give you an idea how small that is, imagine, imagine the Earth. The Earth has a diameter order maybe 13,000 kilometers, okay? So, if I compare the diameter of the Earth to one millimeter, that's how one meter compares to the size of an atom. Okay? So, we can make it into atoms, but then the story doesn't finish. We can even go further inside, and in the atom we will see there is a core, a nucleus, which can be the proton, okay, which is somewhat smaller 
okay, 10 to the minus 15, and we can even look into the proton. There's structure in the proton, and if you look into the proton, you will suddenly reach the realm of particle physics where we hit what we think are the fundamental building blocks of nature. Okay, so this is the size of an atom to the length scale at which particle physics happens is as far away as is one millimeter from the diameter of the Earth, once again. Good. Now, these are the scales we will be talking about today. Okay. But since we have couplings in mind, we need to say which are the fundamental forces which control interactions at all? Well, that's easy. We know about four forces in nature. The oldest known force, and the oldest force which, in effect, has been studied as a physical theory, is, of course, gravity. Okay? And it's a long-range force. It totally controls the structure of the universe. Okay? It makes sure that, um, well, it attracts you down to the earth, so this is why you're sitting on a chair. Otherwise, if the chair wouldn't be there, you would fall down. That's gravity, the culprit. Now we know the electromagnetic force. Now electromagnetism, as you know, is to do with magnets or charged particles. Okay, it's also a long-range force. Electromagnetism is the force which makes sure that, in fact, gravity doesn't win. Okay, and makes sure that you do not fall through the chair on which you're sitting. Good. Now there are two more forces in nature we are aware of. The first one is the strong force, which is short-ranged. That's a force which only acts inside, say, the proton or nucleons. It makes sure that uh, the constituents stick together, okay, and that the proton is a stable particle and is not falling apart. Finally, we have the weak force. Now, the weak force is the force responsible for radioactive decay, okay. Um, good. So, those are the forces we know. Now, but since physics is an observational science, let's talk a little bit about data. So, where do we know something about these forces? Okay. So, the gravitational force is very well observed for very large length scales up to, say, the visible size of the universe, which would be 10 to the 26 meters. So, it would make me walk on my scale roughly till here. Okay. And it's measured down to the sub-millimeter regime. Okay. So it's an impressive range over which we know that the gravitational laws exist and have been verified experimentally. <coughs> Something similar it holds true for the electromagnetic force, which is known even further down to the scales of particle physics. And similarly, both the weak and the strong interactions, which, remember, are short range, so they really properly show themselves once we look inside the proton, but then they will be around and we can see these forces in data. Okay, now when we talk about scales, we also have to remind ourselves that we live in a quantum world. Now for us, this, this is all very strange because we are big objects compared to the microphysics. For us, the world looks classical. When I look at the stick, it is here. Okay, I can touch it, I can throw it somewhere. Classical physics, yes, it has a location, it has a velocity, all is fine. But in the quantum world, these concepts do no longer apply. And this quantum world starts kicking in once we look into atoms, protons, and even further into the realm of particle physics. Now, what are the important bits in a quantum world we have to be aware of? So the first bit is uh, that in a quantum theory, things which seem to be paradoxical actually hold true at the very same time. So, take light. Normally we think light, of course, it's a wave, it's like a radio wave, it's traveling. But in the real quantum world, this is no longer true. Light in a quantum world is at the same time a wave 
as much as it is a particle which carries units of energy. Okay. And Max Planck, who discovered this, okay, he made a very important intellectual contribution to how discoveries in physics can be made. Because he realized that sometimes we have to live with a paradox. We have to accept this paradox to progress in the understanding of nature. So that was Planck's contribution. Okay. A few years later, Werner Heisenberg, the young man at the age of 23, when he suffered from hay fever, he moved on and exhorted himself from, from that stuff and had a holiday on the island of Helgoland, where he finally managed to discover the laws of quantum mechanics. Okay, precisely those laws which describe in, uh, in a, say, mathematical language, okay, the paradox discovered by Planck. Now his trick, his trick to discover these laws was, was also confusing back in the days. His trick was, I don't want to be confused by these things. I want only to talk about physical observable quantities and by doing so, he managed to write down the laws of quantum physics. So the bit which for us is going to be important is that whenever we think about length scales at which we would like to probe the fundamental laws of physics, it means that we need to probe the region of very high energies because length and energy are going to be inverse proportional to each other. Okay, so now we know the fundamental interactions we want to talk about, okay, what are the fundamental particles we are aware of, okay? So here you have the complete collection of particles appearing in the standard model of particle physics. Let me explain quickly what you see. So you see in green three families of fermions. You see in red the quantum particles which now in the quantum world transmit forces. So light corresponds to the photon which arrives in quanta. Okay. The weak force is encoded in the W and Z bosons and the strong nuclear force is encoded in eight <coughs> gluons. Now you also see a blue particle which is the famous Higgs boson which had been discovered um, in Geneva in 2012. So these, all these particles have been uh, observed. So we, are, we know that they exist. And all of these particles interact with each other in one way or another. Okay. So, for example, the electron interacts, uh, yes, maybe with the neuron, which is also electrically charged, by exchanging photons. So, in the quantum world, what these guys are doing is, in the same way as I am throwing words at you, these guys throw photons at each other. Okay? They throw photons at each other, and that's the way they communicate. On a fundamental level, particles communicate by throwing things at each other. Okay? So this here, for example, are the up and down quarks. These guys, these guys, you can build everything you see on Earth. Tables, chairs, atoms, okay? nuclei, all elements we are aware of. Okay? And the way they do it is they constantly throw gluons at each other. This is what makes them stick together and build all the matter we see here. Okay? So all these guys are interacting with each other in one way or another and it's about these interactions and these couplings we're going to talk. Good. So, I've introduced the main players in the field. Now I need to explain why the coupling, the couplings with which these particles interact, why these couplings are running and what do I mean by running? So, in short, what I mean by running is the coupling suddenly depends on the length scale or the energy scale at which particles are interacting. And the reason for this is quantum physics. 
So, because this is so central, I will try to explain that. And the way I'm going to explain that is by example. So I pick an example, say from atomic physics, which covers the length scales between length scales of the atom up to macroscopical scales, say scales we're used to. And the example is the physics of a ferromagnet. Now what's a ferromagnet? A ferromagnet is a block of iron, a substance, you can put it into the room, so a substance which at room temperature in fact is magnetic. Okay, so block of iron, iron, so this is room temperature here, okay, I made a plot, magnetization of that block of matter temp versus temperature, and we see it has some magnetization, okay. But then if we crank up temperature, okay, the magnetization actually goes down. It goes further down, 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 up until it vanishes from some particular Curie temperature onwards. So, what I'm going to do is I will explain to you why this is the case and what this has to do with running couplings on a fundamental level. Okay, so, to explain what's going on, let's have a look into this block of matter. The atoms sitting, so you can imagine it as an atomic lattice, okay? So this will be a typical interatomic distance. And on this little, uh, lattice, we have iron atoms. They're sitting there. Now comes the important point. The one important point about iron is that microscopically, irons are super small magnets micromagnets. So there's an atomic size magnet sitting at each and every site. Okay, that's what they do. Now, what has that to do with quantum physics? Well, the similarity with quantum physics is when I crank up temperature. So what's going to happen? We have these magnets sitting there, but if there's some temperature in the room, they wiggle. There are thermal fluctuations, okay? So, the, so if you think it's showing north and south, no, it's moving all the time, it's wiggling. And the higher the temperature, the more these small microscopic magnets are wiggling. They are fluctuating, okay? So now the question is, how can we then ever deduce what is going to be the magnetization of the whole thing? Yes, remember, we have so many, right? It's 10 to the minus 10 meters, okay? So we have very, very atoms sitting there. Now, studying all these atoms is an enormous amount of work that even the most powerful computers couldn't do that. So, people came up with a smart idea. So, the smart idea is, um, oh, I forgot to mention one thing before I tell you the smart idea. I forgot to mention one thing. So, I wanted to point out that uh, the way these tiny magnets are interacting, of course, is via electromagnetic interactions. Okay? Uh, now, Maxwell was the one who managed to figure out how these laws of electromagnetism work. Okay, so I often see students running around with t-shirts where the Maxwell equations are printed on and I always thought that's a cute idea because no matter how often you wash that t-shirt, the equations will still be correct. Always! <laughs> okay, but now I figured you can even put them on stamps these equations. They will always be correct. Okay? Maxwell also taught us a very important lesson about how to make discoveries. How did he discover the laws of electrodynamics? Okay? Before him, people thought electric laws and magnetic laws are two completely different things, but he figured they are one and the same. Now, how did he do it? He came up with a model. He came up with a model, and that model helped him to find the correct equations for electrodynamics. <coughs> now, the amazing thing here is that the model was wrong. The model was wrong, and we didn't know that he didn't know that nobody knew that at the time. <laughs> okay? This is such an amazing feat. You can get the right physics from the wrong model. Truly amazing. Good. But let's come back to our block of iron, okay? So we have all these micromagnets which are fluctuating. 
things to temperature, okay? And so the effect of fluctuations is what exactly happens in the quantum world, which is why this is a reasonably faithful representation thereof, okay? So we have these magnets wiggling there, but now the trick is, let's make the problem simpler. And so what I will do is, instead of thinking and trying to understand how this magnet is coupled to that one, they're coupled to each other, and in a ferromagnet, what that means is that if they are strongly coupled, they want to point into the same direction. And if all of them point into the same direction, then these mi microscopic magnetic fields become macroscopic magnetic fields, and we will observe magnetization. So, but to understand what's going on, let me instead take four of them, okay, and replace them by their average value. So it's a bit like saying, instead of looking at atomic level into this bulk of matter, I zoom out a tiny bit, okay? And since that worked so well, let me do it with the other guys as well. So I take four, average them, and replace them by the averaged uh, magnetic field, okay? Good. So since that worked so nicely, I have made my problem easier because now I have um, um, way less microscopic magnets to deal with, but still very, very many, so let me do it again. Okay, I zoom out once more and I take these guys. Now I average those. Okay, I get some average magnet and I will do it for all of them. Okay, I've zoomed out a little bit more. Now I can go on and on and on until I get tired. Okay. And so maybe I end up in a setting where finally I realize macroscopically this bulk of matter indeed is magnetized. Now, what I have nevertheless achieved by doing this is I have introduced a notion of how the coupling between uh, magnets is going to depend on the length scale over which I'm evaluating their interaction. So I started with an atomic distance. Okay, and maybe I can either measure with a specific device how strong the interaction is, or I can compute it. Okay, I make my transformation and I see the coupling has started, the strength of the coupling has changed a tiny bit. And I go on and I zoom out. Okay, and so it may be that maybe so. So the example I was showing you corresponds to the example where the coupling has become stronger. Okay. Because we ended up with a, magne with a magnetic field macroscopically. But the most important thing really to take home from this is that couplings very naturally depend on length scales. And the reason for why there is a dependence is because microscopically we have magnets which fluctuate all the time which is why they modify the coupling strings. Good. Now, I could equally have ended up in a different setting. So, if maybe the coupling strength at, atomat uh, at atomic level had been, say, smaller, like here, and if I then make my transformation to compute how strong the coupling is, it could have very well happened that the coupling gets weaker and weaker and weaker and weaker. Okay? This, whether the one or the other happens, now depends on how high the temperature is in my setting. If the temperature is high, yes, the dipoles fluctuate a lot and the coupling amongst dipoles is getting weaker. If the temperature is low, they do not fluctuate that much, and the coupling between them is stronger. So in short, if I end up there, macroscopically my, my bulk of matter is magnetized. If I end up here, no magnetization. Good. So we've learned couplings depend on length scale or energy scale if we were to be talking about quantum particles. But there's one super interesting borderline case, okay, which is the borderline case between the one 
and the other. So imagine I tune the temperature initially to a very particular value, the Curie temperature. Well, then what I would have figured is that the coupling does not depend on distance at all. Now that's totally fascinating. Why is that so fascinating? Primarily, all couplings depend on length and energy, no matter what you do. This is what they do, okay? So if, for some reason, they do not depend on it, something very profound has happened. So let's see whether we can see what has happened here. The thing that has happened here is at this borderline case, yes, coupling, so we see the coupling no longer depends on the distance. So if I look into this block of iron at the critical point and I measure the coupling, I will get that value, fine, but I would no longer be able to know what's the resolution of my microscope at what particular length scale am I looking at? Yes? Am I resolving the length scale here or there or there? I would know the coupling between these uh, magnets is always the same. Okay? So what, I've, so what we learn by this is suddenly at such a critical point physics becomes scale invariant completely scale invariant. So we could zoom out as much as we wanted. We will never be able to see any length scale, any characteristics. Everything will look the same. That's totally fascinating and it's a very particular setting because we, so what's happening here is that we have a super balanced competition between fluctuations on one side and interactions on the other side. And they just so balance out that something particular, very particular is happening. Namely, the system is sitting at a fixed point. And it is these fixed points which are going to play a very profound and prominent role when we are going to talk particle physics in an instant. Now, the material I've just explained to you has developed over many years and the understanding of the physics behind it, okay. Um, a lot of that uh, is due to Kenneth Wilson and to work which he did in the early 70s when he was in his early mid 30s himself. This work is, uh, has been so important that it had been uh, decorated with a Nobel Prize. And uh, in some sense, so we have a technical term, we call it the renormalization group, but uh, I think a more appropriate name would be quantum mechanics at work because this is what element on, on a fundamental level is happening. So we take this type of ideas as a computational tool to help connect physics between different length scales. Okay? Now, um, so in a sense, this is, yes, every, probably, every self-respecting theoretical physicist probably have one version or another of this particular toolbox in his office. Okay, and this toolbox contains a lot of material. Yes, functional renormalization, lattice simulations, and more. Okay, and I see quite a few world-leading experts in this room who have experience precisely working with those tools already for many years. Good. So that's the toolbox with which we are now going to do the real thing. Okay, so I illustrated to you why couplings run something very natural, and I try to explain why it is so particular if they actually stop running. And these fixed points are very important, and we now will discuss what their role is on the level of fundamental particle physics. Okay, so let's go away from the example on atomic uh, physics level, and let's start the real deal on the level of particle physics down here. Okay, so what I will do for now, however, is I will leave out gravity, and the main reason for doing so is that at the level of particle physics, the gravitational force is really way subleading. So, um, 
We could have taken it all along, but it doesn't really matter for what I am going to say. I will come back to gravity uh, a tiny bit later. Good. Now, the standard model of particle physics. I've shown it to you in a glance at the beginning. Okay. Um, so then, so the nice thing with the standard model is that you actually also can write it on a t-shirt, yes, which is something which you can wash, but the standard model okay, is still going to be correct and a very valid description of nature. This, yes, um, And even more so, I mean, the way I like to think about the standard model is that it's really uh, the absolute gold standard of our, of our understanding of nature. Yes, it's the best we have. It does describe all relevant experiments correctly. Okay. Um, let me nevertheless mention at this point this one oddity with the standard model, which is this. It is verified in all experiments. Still, we do know it is not complete. And that's very far puzzling. Okay, it's not complete. Something is missing. Now you would say, of course, yes, dark matter. Our friends from cosmology keep reminding us that uh, more than 60% or whatever of the universe is made out of material where we have not the scientist clue of what that is. Totally true. Okay, dark matter is missing. We still don't know exactly how neutrinos fit into it. Okay, point taken. But still, even if those things were to be in, the standard model, the way we know it, is incomplete. And I will explain also this subtlety for you in a minute. Good. So, now, however, it's showtime for the gold standard. What we have here, I think, is the condensation of very, very many years of understanding quantum particle physics on a fundamental level and comparing it to data. So let's talk about what you see. First of all, this is a coupling constant. Well, I shouldn't call it constant. It's one of those amazing misnomers, right? We know couplings aren't constant. They're anything but normally not constants. So this is the QCD running coupling. And it's going to depend on energy. Remember, energy is roughly the inverse of length. Okay? So this coupling has been probed in so many different experiments with so many different detectors. You see error bars, okay? So when you look at that plot, when I look at that plot, what I see is generations of PhD students sweating, <laughs> calibrating machines for ages, okay? Being careful with their statistical analysis, okay? To finally generate or help contribute to generate this one dot and an error bar around it, okay? So this plot is really a community effort, massive community effort to help understand fundamental particle physics, okay? I really find this extraordinarily impressive. Yeah. Now, that was the experimental bit, but you also see um, straight line. And this straight line here, in fact, is a theory prediction. Now that's amazing as well, but remember, I told you we have this toolbox which we call renormalization group. So this is a, method, a method by which theoreticians, so people like myself with two very pronounced left hands, can try to contribute to this research and figure out and compute with pen and paper perhaps <coughs> how the energy dependence of couplings is going to look like. Okay, so what is most important with this plot, however, is not only that theory and experiment agree to an impressive degree of precision, yes, the most important thing which when this phenomenon was first predicted in 1972, 1973, the phenomenon which is really was noteworthy and which has shaken the particle physics community is the fact that the strength of interactions is going down. So before the 70, early 70s, 
the only interactions people have known was quantum electrodynamics, for example, which is an interaction with, which grows in energy. Now, if an interaction grows with growing energy, there's potential trouble ahead. And in quantum electrodynamics, the trouble which is ahead is that the coupling can become so big that the physical theory becomes meaningless. So this would be a limit of predictivity. Your theory would break down. And what you thought as a fundamental particle happens to no longer be one, would be meaningless. OK. So in the strong nuclear force, however, the discovery that the interaction strength goes down was the first glimpse of hope which particle physicists ever had Yes, that there might exist a fundamental description of nature which is valid up to the highest energies. This is why this plot was a total game changer. Yes, um, and, and for good reason, this discovery um, has been decorated with Nobel Prizes. Okay, so uh, primarily it's due to Gerard Toft, which figured, which, who did this computation at the age of 26 as a PhD student. Okay. David Politzer, who did that as a PhD student of Coleman when he was at the age of 24. Okay. And Frank Wilczek did that computation at the age of 22 when he was a PhD student of David Gross. Okay. So this is just a small hint to all the PhD students in this room. <laughs> okay. Yes. Be ambitious. Okay? <laughs> Good. I don't say any more than that. Okay? So, let me go back, yes, to what I was saying. So, the prediction, the theory prediction is the coupling goes down and it actually, so this is where the data ends, but the coupling goes further down and down and down and down until it reaches zero at asymptotically high energies. That's the prediction. Now, what has that to do with Wilson? Remember, we were saying, Wilson pointed out, there are these particular points where couplings stop to depend on energy. Those fixed points. Okay? And so what these gentlemen here discovered is that the strong nuclear force, in fact, it has a fixed point because the coupling wants to go to zero, and when it, once it reaches zero, it's no longer going to change. So there is an RG fixed point, and it is a vanishing coupling. That's why the phenomenon has been baptized asymptotic, asymptotically high energies, asymptotic freedom. These particles do no longer interact with each other because their coupling has gone down to zero. OK? Good. So. Now, that was the good news about the standard model. We have this strong nuclear force, okay, which could become asymptotically free. But the standard model, the way we know it, is not complete. So let's have a look into this. Why is the standard model not complete? I mentioned that we have electrodynamics. Okay, and so electrodynamic is the interaction, so the, the way the photon couples to the electron. This interaction is growing with energies, and as far as we understand it, it's going to grow without bounds. So this part of the theory is absolutely not understood. Similarly, the way the Higgs particle couples with itself, the coupling can either grow, or it can become negative, in which case um, our universe would no longer be a stable, uh, um, a stable universe. So these things are bad. And these things are limits where theory can, in fact, break down. Good. So the big question is, is asymptotic freedom the only game in town okay, which can save the day in the sense of, is it the only way in which fundamental particles can interact and couple to each other so that the theory or some theory remains valid and predictive up to highest energies. Now, the answer to this obviously is going to be no, but in an interesting way. So clearly, Wilson in the 70s told us, oh, it's also obvious, 
you need a fixed point, whether it's a free fixed point or an interacting one, we don't care. However, after the discovery of asymptotic freedom, yes, people were very happy with having a free high energy fixed point. And the idea that QCD could have a weakly coupled fixed points would look uh, bizarre. Nevertheless, David Bailin came up with that idea in a paper with Alex Loaf in 74. Now the amusing thing with this is David Bailey was here at Sussex at the School of Mathematical and Physical Sciences. He just took up this job here. And then when I was talking to him about this paper, he told me, oh yes, this was such a natural idea to have. Yes, there could be a weekly interacting fixed point. So they wrote the first paper on that idea. The only problem they had is they wouldn't know whether there was any model which, or any particle theory which realizes that theory. Okay, so they had the idea, but they had no working model. So, how, as it is often in physics, there is a beautiful idea. This idea was ahead of its, its time, but then it got forgotten because they don't, didn't figure how to progress. Now, I've been working on this question 40 years later with my collaborator Francesco Zanino from Denmark. We looked into this question coming from a totally different angle. But what we managed to do is we found example theories which do exactly as David Balin had predicted and his collaborator back in 74. Okay. So what's new? All the new stuff which is going to happen on the QCD plot is going to happen down here. If there were just standard model metafields, this coupling would nicely go down to zero as predicted by asymptotic freedom. But now, if there were to be new particles beyond the standard model, then they will have couplings, they will have charges, and they will couple to the strong uh, force, to the gluons. And this is going to change the evolution, but it can change the running of couplings in such a way that still we reach an interacting fixed point, meaning that the theory would be valid down to shortest distances in the sense uh, Wilson has explained to us. Okay, now this is quite exciting because it does suddenly open up a new theory landscape to think about models beyond the standard model. We do know that things are missing, okay, so the name of the game now would be, well, let's see whether the things missing could, could be things which also generate one of these fixed points. Because then we can make reliable predictions up to highest energies. So one of the important new things which it's predicting is new particles. And these new particles often are uh, 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 fermions, but also bosons, okay? Um, they could just be around the corner, yes? They could be sitting here, in which case the Large Hadron Collider at CERN is certainly going to find them. Good. So, that's the situation with particle physics, where I wanted to show you how an old observation from condensed matter fix, uh, physics, namely the idea of fixed points, combined with the knowledge that couplings run intrinsically because the world is quantum, yes, can help us to find models beyond the standard model which remain predictive up to highest energies. So what I'd like to do maybe in the remaining five or ten minutes, okay, I would like now to talk about gravity. Gravity is a completely different force in some sense from the forces I've been talking about uh, before. So let's see what is different. Let's see what is similar and what is different with gravity. Now remember, Oops. gravity, we have data down to 10 to the minus maybe 4 meters, submillimeter regime. Okay, so really down here, we do not have data. That's a pity because it's always, for a physicist, it's always good if you want to construct, understand new ideas. You'd like to test them by experiment, okay? So one of the challenges, of course, now, if we want to talk about quantum gravity, is to find a window where these ideas actually can be tested. 
Okay, but nevertheless, let's first talk about quantum gravity. So, what is gravity? Well, Albert Einstein explained it all to us a bit more than a hundred years ago. He said, good, gravity after all, it's the dynamics of space and time. So you would have thought, oh, it's the apple which is falling down, right? But no, absolutely not. It's the dynamics of space and time. So the apple, in a sense, has some mass or some energy, and because it has mass and energy, it's curbing space-time. Because it's curbing space-time, yes, and the big Earth, which is very heavy, is curbing space-time even more, so space-time suddenly is curved, and then the apple is rolling to the Earth simply because space-time has been modified. Okay? Now we do perceive that as gravity, obviously, but theory underneath it, uh, yes, works in a different way. Now the way, Albert Einstein also showed us a very profound trick on how to make discoveries in physics. So his trick, his trick was to think about symmetries. Because before he came up with his ideas, everything was Newtonian mechanics. And Newton predicted fairly precisely how stars are moving around each other, okay? They had very precise tables and they could predict things to happen. But then there was a slight mismatch. The perihelion of Mercury wouldn't, yes, he would show up too early, okay? And everybody was thinking, oh, that's just this small thing, that's like, okay, your, your math is wrong maybe, okay, just like this little thing, get, get your math right, okay? But no, there was no way to fix this old view of gravity, okay? And Einstein needed to use a new concept, and the concept he used was symmetry. It's relativistic, and I mean, um, um, uh, the notion of an inertial system, okay? He used this concept, and that concept helped him to, found, to find the correct equations. Now, I've been talking to you about particle physics for now, but general relativity, in some sense, is the arena in which particle physics is happening. General relativity, the theory of gravity, gives us space and time, and in space and time, these particles are moving. So it's the scene, the scenery. Okay? Now, gravity, from a coupling constant point of view, Gravity is characterized by Newton's coupling constant, Gn. Okay. Well, there is one interesting feature which distinguishes gravity from other theories. In other theories, coupling, couplings are numbers. They don't have units. Okay, like 0.1 or 5. 5 is maybe a big number and 0.1 maybe a small number, and so we would say 5 is strongly coupled, 0.1 is weakly coupled. But in gravity, Newton's constant has a dimension. Okay, so the dimension is something like, well, it has the dimension of an area for that matter. Okay? So this is one of the differences which make gravity look very different as a quantum theory. Good. So the last thing I want to say about general relativity is, um, of course, General relativity, Newton's force law has much similarity with electrodynamics. Some of you might remember that from high school. Okay. So it shouldn't come as a surprise that there should be gravitational waves. And amazingly enough, those have even been detected very recently. So that's an amazing verification of this theory. And more intriguingly, gravity has something which is completely new, namely black holes. There's a supermassive black hole in the center of the Milky Way. And uh, just a, three weeks ago, or two weeks ago, the uh, Event Horizon Telescope published a photo which is the shadow of a macroscopic black hole in the center of our galaxy. Good. So much for classical gravity. Let's now talk about quantum. What's the quantum with quantum? With Gravity. Uh, what's the trouble with quantum and gravity? Okay. Now, first thing it means is 
space-time is fluctuating as everything which is quantum is fluctuating. So space-time is fluctuating. So there needs to be a quantum for gravity, which people call a graviton. Okay, And so in a quantum description of these phenomena, we would have to find a way to describe how people or objects, masses, you know, are exchanging gravitons, not photons this time, gravitons amongst each other. And because they throw gravitons at each other, the net effect of this is an attractive gravitational force. So what we'd like to do is we would like to find a quantum theory which is precisely doing it. Okay, so you can ask yourself, well, is this actually ever relevant for anything? General relativity tells us when that's relevant. It tells us what is the Planck length, so the length scale from which onwards fluctuations of space-time are going to dominate. So by dimensional analysis, what you find is, so you see the Planck quantum here, which reminds of, of the fact that we look for a quantum theory. You see Newton's coupling appearing, and you do see the speed of light. So what this estimate tells you is we have to go to extraordinarily short distances, 10 to the minus 35 meters, to be able to see the quantum fluctuations of these guys. Now, if you, do, if you try to do that, and people have tried to write down a consistent quantum theory for gravity, but I think it's fair to say that no fully satisfactory formulation exists to date. So the basic problem is there for nearly 100 years, and we haven't managed to fully solve that. And moreover, if we compare it with the strong nuclear force where we've seen it can become asymptotically safe, we do know for sure that gravity cannot become asymptotically, uh, sorry, asymptotically free, okay? Gravity cannot become asymptotically free. No way. That theory would be intrinsically inconsistent. So, what are we going to do? Well, if you have a hammer, everything you see looks like a nail, right? Okay? <laughs> so I've been hammering on things with the renormalization group. So what do you expect me to do now? Okay? I am going to look for a fixed point in this theory. Yes? And so the point is, of course, the idea is not mine. The idea was there very early on. And actually, it also came from the early mid 70s, yes, it was Steven Weinberg, world renowned physicist from the United States, who suggested that a quantum theory for gravity could be built on the exact same principles which Wilson had been put forward. So, requesting that the gravitational couplings achieve an interacting fixed point, they become a constant, only that that constant is not zero because that's the one thing we know cannot happen. Okay. So he gave that setting a name. He called it asymptotic safety. So it means that the coupling becomes big, but not too big. It will settle okay, into a fixed point. Good. So what will we do? So we get our toolbox out and we try to investigate the uh, quantum mechanics of quantum gravity. Now, Weinberg wrote his paper in 76. Martin Walter was, was the one who first picked up the candle and said, yes, let's do that, in 96. And he really broke the ice for many of us, including myself, yes, uh, because he showed us that, in fact, this conceptual framework can carry some weight, and it's worth to spend your time investigating that question. So, in short, let me show you now a diagram on how couplings run in gravity. What I've plotted for you is not Newton's coupling, but Newton's coupling multiplied by energy, because this is a dimensionless coupling, like a number, 5 or 0.1, which is the quantity we want to investigate with these equations. And so we see 
If Newton's coupling is just a fixed number, but we crank up energy to ask what is gravity doing at high energies, then we would see that this coupling becomes very, very big, quadratically in energy. That's the reason for why this type of description is not going to work. But what might work is if we take into consideration, as I've been trying to say the whole day, we need to take the quantum running of couplings seriously. We need to take seriously that this coupling itself is going to depend on energy. And if we do so, then the coupling can grow, but maybe the fluctuations of the gravitons can tame its growth and it can run into a fixed point and we have a beautiful and predictive theory. Okay, so that's the plan. Okay, let me tell you what comes out of that plan. Now, it really has triggered an entire field of research uh, which has grown <coughs> since the late 90s. Okay, we have a lot of evidence for this type of fixed point to be there in practice, yes. And the funny thing, which perhaps people did not see coming initially, the funny thing which this implies is that classical gravity, you know, is characterized by Newton's coupling, but now that we take the full quantum effects into account, what's going to happen is that in the quantum regime, Newton's coupling no longer is a constant, but it becomes smaller quadratically with energy. So the fluctuations of space-time itself make the gravitational force weaker. That's the physics underneath it. Okay, so now, if you want, okay, I'm probably a tiny bit over time, I should maybe rush towards the end, but just like, let me show you a sneak preview into the engine room of what people do who work on quantum gravity, okay, because if we study Newton's coupling, it's just one of very many gravitational couplings. And in order to be sure that actually all gravitational couplings end up with a fixed point, you need to include more and more and more gravitational couplings. And the important result really in this plot is, and which is the work of very many PhD students, postdocs, and colleagues, okay, um, is that we do find this fixed point no matter what, and we also see that it is not too far away from asymptotic freedom. We know asymptotic freedom wouldn't quite work, yes, but we see that this line, if it is on this diagonal, it would correspond to exactly asymptotic freedom, but what we find is something nearby. So this gives a lot of hope that this approach to quantum gravity, in fact, can carry much more weight than people might have thought initially. Okay, so there are many more predictions which have been made over time. You can look into the quantum effects this is going to have on black hole physics, right? We can look into quantum cosmology. We can look into, or we have been looking into well, how these effects uh, may even interfere with metaparticles and possible effects that collide us. So it's a wide field of research going on. Good. So maybe it's time to conclude. What I wanted to show you is this one thing. On a fundamental level, and when we think about fundamental or elementary particles, they interact. But the way they interact, the couplings, the strengths with which they interact, is inherently a quantity which is running, depends on energy. Okay, now the reason for this is that we live in a quantum world and we have abundant evidence for that, so we simply have to swallow that fact and accept that as a part of reality. Now, if we know the running of particles, uh, sorry, the running of couplings, the totally fascinating thing we can do with this is we can predict things to happen in a regime where experiment has not yet delivered data. So we really can make predictions and these predictions are going to help us identify models, working models and extensions of the standard model. Now, 
the irony in all of this is that couplings do run, but occasionally they don't run because they are sitting at fixed points. And these fixed points are so important because those fixed points allow us to extend the validity of these theories to arbitrarily high energies. So, this is mainly my conclusion, but I'd like to add two more words. The first word I would like to add is um, a word of thank um, to all the people I've been working with in the past 10, 15 years. And certainly, I see some of them, certainly to my students and former students, um, who have very substantially and with an enormous amount of dedication um, contributed to make this research happen. I think this is the one thing I can, I mean, this is the one thing I definitely did not see coming when I became an academic. I did not see coming how much pleasure can grow out of working with students on fundamental proper research. And I'd like to thank those of you who've shared that path with me, okay? Um, I'd also like to thank, of course, uh, uh, various funding agencies who, who uh, gratefully enough, dribbled uh, a few pounds into our accounts so that <laughs> students can go and grab, grab some dinner after all and, 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 and those things. Good. Thank you very much for your time. <clears throat>